Hello and welcome to the North Metro SBDC programming. All the information, I think, uh, you know, starting a business is not the easiest uh, part of, of um, life. It's exciting, um, sometimes grueling, and I think uh, ultimately it's a good learning experience on how to, how to work through this. But as Raul said, um, there are definitely resources out there, probably more than you can imagine. And I'm sure that some of you probably have already gone through all of these different websites. And you know, one of the things that I always find interesting is when I meet with clients, they tell me it's just too overwhelming and they just want something that's very direct on the components, how to start and um, the resources. So that's what we're here to do. <clears throat> um, as Raul said, my name is Jesse Esparza. I've been working with small business owners for gosh, almost 17 years. My background, my, my first career was, I was the uh, educator and I'm still an educator. It was a, principal of a high school for five years, uh, principal of an elementary school for 22 years and uh, retired. And, you know, how I got into this business really was I had some business owners who uh, were at my school and um, they were always looking for resources. And when I retired, I went out looking and helping them and I stumbled upon SBDCs. And I thought, how can anything be free? Well, to be honest with you all, nothing is free because you still have to work at getting these resources and obtaining them and using them in a good and very appropriate way. And that's why we do this. <clears throat> so this morning, I'm going to give you a real quick overview. And um, I'll be real honest with you. Um, I like to really take a good quality time of about two hours and and have you really get this information sunk in. Um, in one hour, I'll try to give you uh, all of this information, but note that the real um, the real resource is going to be what you can do with this information after you watch this um, real one hour um, PowerPoint. So here's my name. I um, want you to just um, have the ability to connect with me, connect with the North Metro SBDC, and just know that, as Raul said, we offer some great resources. And these resources, I think, are really most important when you get a one-on-one -on -one consultation, because now you can deep dive into the information that you need and maybe even ask even more questions important questions that relate to your um, kind of business and the kind of permits, the kind of, of um, <clears throat> resources that are more apt for your type of business. And then, you know, actually, you know, get into the training and education that we provide through the resources. And I'll kind of give you a little bit more as we go along. Please ask the questions. Um, I am sure that, you know, Raul will, will um, keep, check on that um, chat if, if it gets into um, that information and he can um, give me a feedback on the questions that might come up. You can also yell at me, you can stop me, you can do anything that um, will hopefully give you an opportunity to get your questions answered. Remember, basically SBDCs, we're here to provide you with help to start, grow, and prosper. That's the basic components of an SBDC. What we're going to cover this afternoon is these four components. I'm going to give you some overviews of the legal components. I'm going to talk about just, you know, real briefly why it's important to brand yourself, the organizational structure that is critical. So many, so many businesses um, that we get <clears throat> are, are really kind of in a position of of dying because of organizational structure. What ultimately is happening is that the business is controlling them rather than they controlling the business. So that's really important. And so do not discount the fact that you have to organize and be in control. 
And then, of course, just a little bit of taxes. You know, we're not accountants and we're not attorneys, but I think to give you a general overview of what you might need is going to be important in terms of the taxation component. This is really a, something for you to ponder. Most of you that are here this afternoon, I would suspect th this is an image of you. And and just note that on the left side, um, your right side, that um, the, the patterns are very normal, that you are small business owners. Most of you are not going to have employees. You're mostly home-based. On the right side, the success rate is really, really important that you really need to consider. You know, we know in the state of Colorado, in generally, that the first-year businesses have a difficult um, the concept of, of really being successful. Why? There's a lot of reasons. But most likely, the first-year business is not going to make it if they do not prepare with the needed tools that are out there and work their way to success. So keep in mind that the first three years is going to be difficult. And it's not just the simple of starting the business and it's going to, you know, automatically be successful. I mean, there are some you know, abnormalities, obviously. Some do very well. But this is the realistic data that I think is important that we want you to consider. And that's why we do these um, these uh, type of, of um, seminars. We're going to talk about the legal components. And I'm going to very briefly and generally give you the overviews of these different components that are going to be very essential to your business and you're going to be making decisions based on the type of entity for the sake of your taxes and also for the sake of the type of security that you want for your business as well as the concept of how complex you want this business to get and to be as you grow and so again in the state of Colorado there's basically four different type of entities now Again, when you get to a limited liability company, you get a more complex kind of, of limited um, liability, and you could just really begin to get a little bit more sophisticated. And, and there are different types of limited liability companies. And then, of course, the corporations, there's an S and a C. Usually, SBDCs, we most likely would be working with the S corporations. The C corporations are fairly huge um you know they garner additional resources and and they get them through other um you know more sophisticated resources but but not um unlike i mean we still do have some of those um c corps so let's move in to the general information about the type of entities so the first one is the sole proprietorship and generally, the sole proprietor is really very simple. It's one owner. You you know, that individual is not going to be an employee of their own business. The liability is pretty much on you, the individual. And most of you know that it's a very simple type of entity. If, in fact, you start a business and you never name it, it's going to be a just, I'm, I've got a nice little craft, you know, art, you know, business, and I'm doing business just as Jesse Esparza, well, basically, I don't really, really even ever have to register it. But the the day that I name it something like Art Jesse's Art Studio, then I have to register it. Basically, these are DBAs, doing business as. They definitely are very inexpensive. They're not, as I said, eminent to be registered type of entities um, and really it's a pass-through tax entity meaning that the business is not going to be paying any taxes you the individual is going to be paying taxes so it passes through any profits that this business is going to make 
it's going to pass on from the business onto you, the individual, and it's on your tax um, bracket that you begin to realize the taxes for. The, um, the, the detriments to a um, sole proprietorship, obviously, in this sense, is that it is not a separate entity. It is you. Whatever decisions you make for this business, you're making them for yourself as well as for the business. And there is no separation. That is why they call this unlimited liability. So bad decisions, they become your dis bad decisions. And also they become the decision of all of your assets that you may own. Good decisions, they become good assets and for all of your personal assets as well. When in fact the business is ready to be changed to another name or you're be beginning to realize you need to get rid of it, then ultimately it has to be dissolved. It can't be moved to another family member under the same name um, and, and that is the end of that business. The other type is the general partnership. So when I say that this is about the same as the sole proprietorship, it means that the only difference is that it has more than one individual. So everything I said about the sole proprietorship is an echo to the general partnership. The only difference is that there in fact is more than one individual. And there are some positives. Obviously, the positive is that when you have more than one individual in a partnership, then you have the ability to divide the responsibilities and it becomes a little bit more workable and many times it has a little bit more ability for um, a, a, attracting some funds, especially if you have not just one person, but you have two, three, maybe four. So a general partnership can be more than one individual and as many as you want. Obviously, the more complex, the more it's going to cost you in terms of some of the um, funds to provide for an accountant and or for an attorney. So therein lies some of the detriments. Remember that any decision that I make and R Raul and I are business partners as a general partnership, any decision I make affects Raul. And therein becomes the reality that that is why we strongly say that if you're going to do a general partnership, you probably want to really sit down and work on a, an agreement that works for the parties um, in, in the business. And that is really an important um, document because it can be changed. It can work for you for one year. It can be, you know, added into a different kind of document the second year. But the operating agreements really work well when you have general partnerships. Same concept is that there's no real protection for general partners. And the business, once a partner leaves, and if you have two individuals, when one partner leaves, it becomes a sole proprietorship, then you have to change the type of entity. Here we begin to see the difference that is very, very divided into the type of entity that the state of Colorado defines as a legal business. So the limited liability company does in fact create a real separation between you, the personal individual, and your assets, and the business assets. But here are the important components. It has some of the, the, same, um, the same concepts as a sole proprietorship and a partnership, and it kind of looks like that would be a sole proprietorship or a partnership. So an individual, one person can be and set up a limited liability company and it can be a single owner. Um, you can have 
many individuals in a limited liability company, and then you have a limited partnership. They have to be separate. In other words, there's basically five very, very important components to a limited liability company. One, you have got to create a name that is different than just your name. Number two, you have to obtain an employee identification number through the IRS, which they call an EIN. You cannot use your social security. You could use your social security for a sole proprietorship and a partnership, but you cannot use the social security for the limited liability company. The third important component that separates this as a very true entity is that you have got to get a bank account that is separate from your own individual personal account. And the fourth is that you have to establish all of these records on a formalized monthly um, uh, cash flow so that the business can prove that it will be paying the fifth, which is the estimated taxes, if it is making a profit. So that's really important as we look at the difference between the other two entities that I um, referred to. The owners <clears throat> are called members, and you will receive and obtain the Articles of Organization, which is your document to prove that you are a limited liability company. They do have protection. And so the concept of protection is based on the fact that you do not co-mingle. So the minute that you start using personal credit cards to fund a limited liability company, you have co-mingled your entity and it no longer is a limited liability company and now has just transferred itself to be a sole proprietorship. So that's why it's really important that you do not commingle any of your personal assets with your um, your business assets. So personal computers, personal items, those you have to really be in the process of designating them for business and, and so that you're ultimately separating all those um, uh, equipment it from your personal assets. The um, members are protected if you do not commingle. And so if you have a bad decision in business and you have not commingled, it does not affect your personal assets. One of the positive things with a limited liability company is you can treat it as a corporation. In other words, with the limited liability company, you cannot receive wages. You are not an employee you can only withdraw money out of this limited liability company. But if you treat it as a corporation, then you have defined it as a, a S corp and you now can become an employee of this limited liability company that is treated as a corporation. Some of the detriments, of course, is that it could be costly as you begin to um, develop the more sophisticated components of this limited liability company. And as the forms begin to um, be established and needed, you may need an accountant or you may need an attorney. So again, the more individuals you have in a limited liability company and the component of the, um, the operating agreements that you may need may require an attorney. So that's something you got to be cognizant in terms of how you're going to be um, working and establishing the responsibilities for that. Remember that usually the sole proprietor, I'm sorry, the sole member um, for the IRS is the LLC. And that's how the IRS treats sole uh, entities of LLCs as sole members. That's the only difference. Hi, Jesse. Yes, sir. We've got a, a few questions stacking up, so I just wanted to address those real fast. Um, so Lynn is asking, where does professional corporation fit in? Professional corporation. Um, 
I would say, um, Lynn, that's just, again, it, it, it's a little bit of the concept of the either the C or the S. I mean, it's a professional corporation is either an S or a C, one of the two. Let us know if that answers your question, Lynn. We could ask uh, deeper questions too. Uh, okay. Trace, Trace is asking, or oh, go ahead. How do I tell if it's an S or a C then? Um, well, uh, the Lynn, on the S, you will be filing a 2550 form that defines you as an S corporation. Um, and that becomes part of the um, the uh, document that you would file when you are going to register your business. So if you file, and it's something that you're going to be talking probably to an accountant with. And when you file the LLC, if you wanted to file it as an S Corp, then you have to file another document that is going to be created as an S Corp and not an LLC. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then Trace was asking, uh, you mentioned five uh, things that for an LLC, five key things. If you could just recap those five things real quick. Yep, it has to have a, it has to have a name other than yourself. It has to have an EIN and not a social security. It has to have a bank account that is a business bank account. It has to be established with a monthly cash flow to prove that you are establishing the uh, revenue and the expenditures on a monthly basis and the fifth that you have to then prove that you don't have to file for uh, estimated taxes. And, and if you do, then it will show through the monthly cash flow process every quarter. Thank okay. you. Yep, couple more questions here. It says, what if your office is in your home for an LLC? Does that affect anything? You're saving money. Good job. Because <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a corporate, a, a brick and mortar. But, um, and I'll get into a little bit of some of the resources that you have the ability to uh, use for that process. Yeah. But here's a good question in terms of commingling uh, funds under LLC. Just on the assets can't be commingle. Uh, but to start up, can I use my own account for the expenses? But once I make money, then it needs to go into a separate account. How does that work? Uh, what line? Good question. So that would be an accountant question. Um, I can tell you that the, probably the accountant is going to say everything you do before you register the business is really the money you can use to start the business. And it's all your money. And it probably is a tax deduction. Um, I think that's what an accountant would say. Um, once you start the business, then the official date of starting is now you have to use the business money to uh, work the business. Do you, uh, you have to answer a couple more questions here? Sure. Okay. So uh, Alicia is asking, how do we write in articles of incorporation? And she also mentioned she it's a little hard to hear you. Okay. I'll get a little closer. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think that you do not write an article of incorporation um, because when you register your business, then that is the document of what you're registering becomes the article of organization or the article of incorporation. So that is the document that is created when you register the business. And then another question, when I registered my LLC, I was sent some bills. One was a form for good standing request for $70. Another was to have a law poster. Tear them up. Tear them up. Those are <laughs> propaganda. Don't pay anything. <laughs> all right. Good. And that's I'm it. Glad you asked. They, they, those are all propaganda tools that anybody can walk in to um, the Secretary of State and, and send you stuff. Okay. Oh, uh, one, one more quick question that came up. How does one get paid if not allowed to receive wages? Well, usually um, you got, you can send, uh, I'll, I'll send you my address and you can send them to me. Just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. All right. What you do is basically you just withdraw money out of the business account. 
that's the only way a limited liability can be paid unless you're creating yourself as a corporation, which then you are establishing yourself as an employee to be able to um, get a salary uh, or a paycheck. <clears throat> okay. All right. Any other questions? Good. So just um, to move on to the concept of corporations, just know that that corporations are a bit different and um, they are a, a different uh, entity from a LLC. Remember, the LLC looks like, feels like a, a sole proprietor or a partnership, um, but it has a whole legal differences. A corporation now needs to have these components. It has to be a legal separate from those individuals that, that create this entity. And it has to have a board of directors and it also has to have a set of bylaws. You will be establishing the corporation with the article of incorporation rather than the article of organization. Those are the differences between the LLC and the corporation. And then, of course, you must be set up with the procedures to be able to have annual shareholder meetings. That's the corporation expectation. So when you think about a corporation, there are basically two types. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> and so the, the two different types of corporations are the S Corp. And I think I had explained to you earlier that if you decide to become an S Corp, then you have to file a 2553, I'm sorry. And that would then treat you as a pass-through entity, meaning that the corporation itself would be an entity that is having to pay taxes on its own, but the S Corp can be a pass-through tax like the LLC, and therefore it is based on the individual's um, tax bracket, and it's a pass-through, like in a sole proprietor. Uh, you must file the corporate um, documents within 75 days once you become an S-Corp, and then that becomes then part of the shareholder concept, and that is that rather than the concept of the LLC being uh, owner it, it, um, designated business, it is now a shareholder designated business. In other words, if you own 51% of the shares, then you are the major owner. And that's how it's defined in terms of the ownership. Again, these probably are type of entities that you would want an attorney and or an accountant to work with you to develop. There are some positive components to the corporations, um, and that is that they are really very advantageous in the sense that they um, have a lot of more, a lot more tax uh, benefits uh, as compared to, say, the solo partnership or the LLC. Um, it does not pay corporate taxes uh, like the C Corp or the entity itself. And you can also divide all of the expenses by its shareholders. So if you have, you know, three different shareholders, you can divide all of those expenses into those three individuals. It does have better protection um, than, say, a sole proprietor, a partnership, or an LLC. Um, and it also can raise some additional funds through its stock. The detriments really are that it has to be a domestic corporation. Um, it must be only one class of stock, and it can't. You can't have an A or a B class. Most likely, an S corporation is going to be a C stock, and it has some very, very specific guidelines on how the earnings are going to be produced. Again, probably an accountant and an attorney is going to be working with you on some of those uh, components. It does have some guidelines on the passive income earnings, such as the kind of royalties and dividends that you can obtain through an S-Corp. Therefore, it can be costly 
And ultimately, even though they're much more protected than, say, the other entity, you can lose the protection uh, of an S-Corp um, as well. Okay, so again, just to, in, in general to uh, summarize, I, I think it's important that all of you understand that really it's about, you know, what is this entity that I'm going to start? Who's going to be the owner? Very important questions. Who's going to control? How will this be, uh, be managed? And the revenue, what kind of revenue am I looking for? The tax, what kind of taxation am I going to anticipate? Um, who's going to hold all the assets? Some of these questions are going to be important that are also going to be connected to probably the type of entity that you want to start. You can go from a sole proprietor to a partnership, and you can do a partnership to a, an S-Corp or an LLC, and you can do LC to an S-Corp. The, part, the uh, ed, sole proprietor is going to cost you $25 um, as a trade name, the, and, and so is the partnership. The limited liability company is going to cost you $50, and so is the S Corp and the C Corp. By the way, then you also have to, uh, once you register the entities, then once a year you have to update your entity and it only costs you $10. The key to this is that if you um, remiss in updating your entity and you pass 60 days, then to um, activate it again it may cost you up to a hundred dollars so it's worth the ten dollars that you pay to update it because it's only ten dollars a year but if it passes the 60 days it could cost you a hundred dollars any questions before we move forward on any of the entities I just want to, um, I answered a couple of questions in the chat, but good to get them out there so everyone can hear. So uh, somebody's asking if um, we can send this uh, video out to you guys. We are recording it. We're going to email it to everyone. Uh, and and then also there's a little part of that about English not being their their main language. So are there, are there any resources in Spanish that, um, or possibly other languages that might be helpful for people? Toda esta información está en español y si algunos de ustedes quieren tener toda esta información está total en español, denme una llamada y hacemos una cita y también tengo estos um, seminarios en español para que ustedes los que necesiten toda la información, no nomás lo que es en este, el, el punto del, del uh, class que tenemos, pero también de todos los uh, recursos que tenemos. Okay. One one more re uh, here real quick. And then uh, as far as, um, is there a list that can be shared of various resources like recommended attorneys, accountants for for people? Well, SBDCs do not make recommendations, particularly of accountants, of attorneys, and of insurance agencies. Uh, Basically, you know, we have to be careful. There are opportunities that we can select three individuals and you make the decision on one. What happens is that many times these individuals aren't available. And so when what I've experienced in trying to keep the three um, individuals re referencing that then you get back to me and say, well, they're not getting back to me. So, you know, we have to keep vetting these individuals. And so I've gotten in the practice and you might find other consultants who can find three and will sustain those three and guarantee that they're going to, you know, call you so that you can vet them. But um, especially accountants are very difficult. You know, there are, I think, in demand. And so when I select three and I give you three, then... Um, you call me back and say they're not calling me back and so i don't do that too much anymore 
I let you do the work in trying to find those individuals that are in high demand. And that's the same thing with attorneys. So. But we do sometimes have attorneys and or accountants as consultants. Not so much accountants, but uh, sometimes we do have attorneys available. Okay. Um, another question, how do I switch from a DBA to LLC? Basically, you dissolve the trade name DBA, and then you uh, would have to uh, register a new LLC as a brand new business. And then are there any tax advantage disadvantages, say, uh, to starting an LLC, but not operating for six to 12 months? I need to buy a vehicle for the business, but that vehicle won't be ready for up to a year. There's probably some tax advantages and disadvantages. I'm not an accountant. I would say you probably just need to ask that question to an accountant because I really could not tell you what that would be uh, in specific terms. Uh, Follow-up question real quick on the DBA to LLC. Can they continue to use the EIN that was assigned to the DBA? Um, yes, but you have to change. You have to file a form uh, with the IRS to make sure that you've changed the, the name of the business to match the EIN, if that's what you're going to do. And then another quick question came up. Uh, can we find attorneys or accountants with the Chamber of Commerce? I'm sure you could. They, that would be a good, a good uh, resource. Okay. So I wanted to just uh, give you an uh, opportunity to look at the steps. And again, one of the, I think, simplest ways to show you how important the process is, is to kind of give you a sense that these are the steps in order that probably you want to be following. Um, you have to do first the Secretary of State in order to obtain the EIN, because you'll need information from your business to obtain the EIN. And then you're going to need to obtain, if you are a product business, um, then you will need to obtain a sales tax license and you will need one and two in order to get number three. One of the nice opportunities that the state of Colorado offers My Biz Colorado, you can click that and I'm going to send you a list of all of these resources, by the way. Um, and then you just click that and you can go to number one, you can go to number two, you can go to number three, and you can even go to some of these others within the cities. And so my biz is a good resource if you can get into that because it has a lot of already existing uh, information. One of the things that um, I think is important for all of you that are starting a business this year, 2024, um, it's a new law that you will have to obtain this um, uh, registration that is the new law that came into effect for any new business. You have 90 days to register with the, um, the um, beneficial ownership information. I'm going to go ahead and go there because this is really critical. Um, information that is going to really um, be important. You will get fined if you do not um, complete this form within 90 days if you're starting a new business. So keep this in mind. If you have already started your business before 2024, then you have till the end of the year to register. But if you're doing it now, you have 90 days and you would go to the beneficial ownership information and you can do the e-filing and then um, actually get it completed. It's really to curb any illicit financial activity that occurs on your business. Uh, and in the past, there have been, you know, some very illicit, illegal activity because, um, for example, Secretary of State information is public. And so this is why the Financial Crime Enforcement Network is insisting that every new business, if it's an LLC, not if it's a sole proprietorship or a partnership, but if it's an LLC or a corporation, you must file this within 90 days when you register.
And this will also be um, part of your resources that I'm going to provide you when um, when Raul gives it to you. Okay. Then, of course, the next step is going to be for you to uh, register at your business office. City of Westminster, I had that. Um, and that one is also, I think, another really good resource for you is to be able to actually access, for those of you that are in Westminster, and since this is a Westminster-sponsored um, seminar, I want to also take you there, only because it really is going to be, those of you that are in Westminster, it's a benefit in the sense that you've got some really good resources that um, the city of Westminster is offering you. So when you go to this website, um, you go to the business section and you go to the business license, that'll get you, um, you know, the information you need. But you will also notice that there is some resources that the um, city of Westminster is also um uh, going to offer you. So check into that in starting a business in uh, Westminster. There are some good resources that I think will benefit you, those of you that are living in Westminster or have a business in Westminster. Good luck. Okay. Um, and I always think it's important to then, of course, obtain the separate bank account because you'll need the, the Secretary of State information. You'll need the EIN from if you're doing a, a LLC uh, in order to get the bank. And then even though it's not a requirement by law, we always say it's a good, very good, um, important step to obtain a business insurance. And then always action plan is always good to do. Okay, looking at the component of insurance, all I'll say is that it's really important to consider general business liability insurance. This is going to protect you in terms of your business for any loss or any injury that occurs in your business. Remember that if you are home-based business, you still have to have general business liability insurance because your home insurance is not going to protect what you are doing in business and that's just something very important that many don't understand product liability insurance is important if you have a product you may want to insure just for the safe and security of those individuals that you're selling the, your product especially if it has some you know uh, high risk possibilities to it if you're having a service then at least consider completed operation insurance that's you know, something that will help you in terms of the um, possibility of your, you know, service not being complete or somebody suing you, these kinds of insurances will help in the long run. Let's talk about branding. Of course, a business is not a business. Quick question, Jesse, on the insurance. Sure. Uh, any suggestions on maybe where to go to get insurance, find insurance? Yes, you can. Most insurance um, companies, if you already have a car insurance, if you have home insurance, the big big box insurance companies have a, a business a department for businesses. So it's always good to um, put together some of those, you know, the home insurance um, that you have with the business you get a good, you know, discount for having those packaged together. So again, you know, State Farm, Allstate, Farmers Insurance, all the big boxes will have a business department for business liability insurance. Branding is important. So when you think in terms of communicating who you are, what you do, it's all about the value. And that's, I think, one of the most important components here to discuss your, with your business. Just remember that 
your business is representing you and you're representing your business. And so if you have a set of combined values that you're going to use, that's really the very first good communication component to begin to express to others. And so that begins to provide you with really the characteristics of your business, the clarity, the particular brands, and it also then connects you to particular customers. So when you think in terms of the values, it's all about how those values are going to be accentuated into the goals that you are going to uh, be wanting to accomplish, not for you, but for your customers. So a mission statement is good to at least reflect on, you know, what, who are you? What is it that you do? You know, what kind of values are you going to promote within, say, the product or the services? And therein lies then the goals that you have. So, you know, one of the things that I always try to express to my clients is, you know, when you're, when your potential customers are paying you, say, $100, $50, what do they get in return? Therein lies the concept of the goals that you want for your customers. And that is all part of branding. Once you have a good brand and you have communicated, really it's about staying in touch. It's really that research that says to your potential um, target population is, where are they? Who are they? And how do you connect with them? What is the information that you're providing them? And what are the strategies that you're going to utilize? So again, remember that the whole process of this research is to find out whether you have a competitive advantage over those other businesses that are already out there. I don't think I have found a business that, that a brand new business that exists that doesn't have competition. So keep in mind, you're going to have competition, but how you establish your values and how you define the research and what it is that you are creating for that um, target population that you have a competitive advantage is going to be really critical to your success. And where can you find research? It, it, it's amazing. One thing I'd like for all of you to at least test, and that is for you to go to census.gov. Anymore, you can literally go to the block. You can look at a zip code, and you can find out by looking at U.S. Uh, the census um, um, website. You can find out, you know, what the income is of that of that um, zip code. You can find out how many families there are, how many children, or what, how many vehicles they have. You know, what is the average um, industry? You know, employment. There's all kinds of information that you can find from census.gov. I really would recommend that you look at that information. And for those of you that are still connecting and needing to target, we've got a lot of good databases that will help you through SBDC. Um, the city of Westminster will have some good data because they collect data for all potential industries that are coming in. Um, and so almost all the cities that I've got two here, but I would say every city will have good, good, very current data that will help you on the uh, demographic information. The other kind of information that is really critical is going to be primary research. You know, why do I like what I like? And and, and where is it that I like to, to, um, uh, to, uh, uh, to be able to shop? Um, and so those become more uh, social, very connected matters to individuals. And so primary data is also a very good source. And the census.gov is another great place. It probably has about 50 pages of research that has already been done about what people like, why they like what they like, and where, they, where they're going to get what they like. So keep in mind that the census.gov site is, is that it's a brand new opener for business to do good research.
one of the things that's important is to really begin to define your target. And that's really how you can actually establish a good competitive advantage. When you have defined your target, really it's the concept that, you know, for every dollar that you are going to spend in marketing, you want probably $10 in return. But if you don't find the target and if you're not connecting to a target, every dollar that you put out there for your marketing may not bring you anything back. And that's because you may not be connecting to the right target. So very important key components to marketing. It's important to know what value you're adding and where is your competition. So it's really critical to begin to ask them questions and ask yourself questions. And also very, very clearly good to shop the competition and analyze what they're doing, and what is it that you're going to do differently that brings value to what you have. Very key in the process. So we talk about, and initially I had mentioned to you about organizational structure. Remember that record keeping is essential because data collection is critical to your business. It helps you manage and it helps you plan, and it also helps you to really begin to system analyze what you're doing in terms of the, you know, the continuum of your business. So keeping records is really critical because it helps you make decisions, and it also helps you to report the information that the entities, um, that agencies that are really looking for your information or that need it. So a filing system is critical, organize it any way that I think is important so that you understand it. it can be online or hard copy. It's good to have both. And remember, it's really in order for you to provide proof um, in case one of those two at one time or another goes out. Organizational structure is good in the sense of management because it helps you plan and you setting up your business. It helps you raise the kind of money that you need. It helps you plan your financial affairs. And if you're ever going to have employees, it can tell you whether, in fact, you are ready for an employee or not. Management helps you monitor and control the operations. It helps you keep good records. It helps you analyze the, you know, month to month. And Ultimately, it helps you to determine that you're working with a team. Remember that if you are one person business, you still have a team of six individuals. And it's good to always have and know an accountant. It's always good to have and know an attorney. It's good to have the insurance agent that's going to help you grow the business. It's going to help you to um, work through the changes that are occurring. It's also very important to have an IT person when, you know, anymore when your um, when your uh, uh, internet goes down, it's almost like driving a car. You can't do without the internet anymore. And then finally, it's good to have an, a banker that you at least will connect. Someday you'll need a loan. The sixth person is, I would say, as important, and that is going to be your um, business consultant. SBDCs has a lot of good business consultants that they can work with you, um, you know, quarter by quarter, year by year, helping you develop your goals, helping you develop the new changes that are occurring in your business. Keep one of those individuals right next to you because they're going to help you grow your business. Remember that an organizational structure and a system is only the concept of making things simple. Make sure that it's easy to understand. It can be used to track and needed information, especially for taxes. You know, and the IRS doesn't want you to have to have QuickBooks or have all of these different sophisticated um, systems uh, and tools. All they want is that you have something that's reliable, accurate, and consistent 
and that you know how to operate it and communicate it back to those individuals that need it. One of the best type of organizational structure um, tools is the financial statements. The one that's probably most important for a startup is the cash flow statement. That's going to tell you the amount of revenue that's coming in every month, the amount of expenditures that you are incurring, and what is left for next month. Can you actually run your business with what's left over, or are you going to need some additional revenue? Those are key components that the cash flow statement is going to help you with. The income statement is a little bit different because if you have products, it's going to tell you what your cost of goods is costing you. It's going to tell you um, whether you have a profit or not and whether you are, in fact, needing to pay taxes on the profit that you have created. And then, of course, if you are a brand new business, you probably don't need a balance sheet unless you've already put you know, thousands and thousands of money into this startup. A balance sheet basically is going to tell you the liabilities that you have created to start this business as well as the assets that you already have. Usually about six months to eight months after you've started, you're going to probably be good to have a balance sheet because then you begin to show what kind of liabilities and what kind of assets are in this business that begins to create value for your business. And again, as I said, I'm not a CPA or an accountant, <laughs> but ultimately there are some very important components to taxes. And that is that there are basically three types of very important um, um, type of taxation components that you need to understand. One is that you need to, if you're having to be a business that is going to sell products, then you will need a sales tax license. And this Colorado retail license is basically the same as a sales tax license. If you sell or rent anything to the end user, those are the type of licenses that you're going to need through the Colorado.gov site. The Colorado Wholesale License is the type of license that you're selling. I'm sorry, if you're buying business to business, you don't need to collect sales tax from individuals of other businesses that you're buying from. But then you may need a wholesale license. That might be something that they're going to require. The use tax is an important component that is critical no matter if you are a a product-oriented business or a sales, I'm sorry, a service-oriented business. Most of us will be paying a use tax. If you buy a equipment that you're using for your business. So, for example, I go to, um, I go to um, Best Buy and I, I buy a computer. And I say to the operator, customer service person that, I'm a business, I'm going to use my EIN, and rather than paying for, say, $2,000, uh, it would cost me at 8%, 8.5%, maybe eight hundred and um, about $160. So I say to the um, customer service, I'm a business, I don't, I don't have to pay taxes. So they're right, I don't pay taxes, and so I don't have to pay the tax because I'm a business. I take that to my home. I start using that computer for business. Now, the city I'm in is going to require that I pay their share of the tax because I'm using that tool to make business. That is what's called a use tax. So, again, keep that in mind that, you know, we all pay taxes. And in some way or another, even as a service business, you may have to be paying taxes. Property taxes, again, they're assessed on real or personal property. If you're renting a space, you're going to be paying sales tax on that rent. If you're renting uh, equipment, then you're going to be paying sales taxes, even if you are a service business. Jesse, question on the sales tax. Do uh, numbers asking, do I need to get a sales tax license if I sell on Amazon? I have a question. Okay, go ahead, and I'll answer it. 
Okay. For the use tax, um, let's say I I bought an equipment and I use it daily. You you have to claim that use tax on the equipment every year or every quarter. Like, is it a real curing tax? Does that make sense? Well, that's going to depend. Um, like I said, it, it just all depends on, and that would be a, an accountant question because it depends on the equipment and how much you paid for it um, because you may be now moving towards the, um, the the component of a different kind of uh, deduction based on the kind of equipment that you just purchased. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's not it's not just cut and dry. Anyway, the first question was what, uh, Raul? Yeah, so do I need to get a sales tax license if I sell on Amazon or e-commerce, for, for example? So if anyone um, sells on the internet, um, then if the, the the state says that you, if you're selling to individuals in Colorado, you have to collect sales tax. If you're selling to anyone outside of the state of Colorado, you do not have to collect sales tax. And again, that's probably a question because there's so many ambiguities and there's so many, you know, um, different nuances to that. For example, um, a, a Home Depot is a business that's on the internet, but because they have a brick and mortar, then they collect sales tax. So those are things that I think you really do need to talk to an accountant. But in general, anyone who sells on the internet to some degree does have to pay some, oh, I'm sorry, does have to collect some form of tax. And if you are a seller, like you said, then some of those companies already set it up for you. Um, Shopify, some of those companies already set up the taxation for you, Instagram. And so you have to check with them in terms of what they're doing to create the uh, tax already that's um, set up. There are also companies out there that will sell, uh, I'm sorry, that, that will collect your tax on the, any internet sales that you make and they're companies that you pay for for the service. I have a question also. Sure. I have an LLC and so I buy wholesale and then I resell it on my shop. Which is the best uh, license tax that I should get? I'm not sure if I should get the license, sales license tax or the wholesaler tax. Um, Yvette, I would, I would investigate on both because they might really, you know, you might be able to use both of them at different uh, venues and different you know, depending on what companies, uh, how they work, you know, the the sale. So, you know, there not one size fits all. I've I've known that that's really part this whole thing with sales tax, and an accountant will really be helpful in saying, yeah, this is the best one, but there's other ones going to work when you're you're selling because other companies see in different states have different requirements. So, you know. All I can say to you is that check into both because they can both bring you some better benefits than just thinking one is your answer to what you're going to do. Okay. Um, would you mind going back a couple slides to where you did have this, uh, all the three types so I can just quickly, oh yeah, uh, one, one, one more. Yeah, that one. Yep. Thank you. Sure. Got another question here, Jesse. If I publish a book that is connected to my business and I write the cost of publishing the book off, then the revenue is income for the company, correct? That sounds like it, yeah. Revenue, yep. Yeah. If the book is, I mean, if it if it's a part of the business, yeah. Okay. So let me go and finish this up because I think, uh, I know we're running a little bit out of time. I wanted to show you this uh, publication for those of you that are um, in, in the, the products and you're needing to know more about taxation. 
This is a really good publication. It has almost everything you need to know about how to calculate the tax, the sales tax, the amount of sales tax that you're going to need in your city, how to file it, the local sales tax, recording and requirements, all of that. It's really a good publication. I would recommend that you, you know, down, download it on your computer and you have it there. And by the way, um, this is another resource that I think is really good for you to be able to know that the IRS um, isn't all bad. Um, they have some really good resources that will give you some really good um, ideas and support on how to deduct your business expenses and how to run your um, business out of your home uh, that, that is legal. So these are really good resources too. And I'm, as I said, I'm going to give you the, these resources as well. One of the things that I, um, I attest to, and, and I think, you know, my mantra is a business plan. I cannot imagine anybody just, you know, I mean, there are businesses that, you know, start up and you kind of set them up by the seat of your pants. And it may be exciting, um, but if you're going to spend money for a business, I, I hope that, you know, at least you have some reliability of success with it, uh, some kind of a plan. That's just my editorial. There are different kinds of business plans. There are pro forma business plans. If you're looking to borrow money, then most likely a lender is going to want a pro forma. Pro forma means that it has a set of financials for about three years of projections with cash flow, three years of a projection with um, profit and loss, and three years of projection with, say, a sales forecast. That's a pro forma, and then usually it'll have all of these components here that are seven of the very essential components that make up your business in terms of the um, of the components that are going to drive those say uh, those financials and that's how the lender will have at least the understanding that you might have a higher probability of success if you're not going to need a loan um, then basically consider a one-year plan. Startup cost, that's really important to sort of know what you're going to have. Create your brand, set up a set of goals for one year, create the activities, and then forecast how you're going to be spending that, um, so how you're going to be making the, the revenue for a year. And that would really help as you work through a one-year plan. It, it's not any real sophistication that you really need. If you have that business action plan, then you create the, the value, the mission, the goals, and you can determine if you've accomplished your goal. Why do businesses fail? Well, we know that all of these um, six components collectively, we can never say it's because one of these. Usually, you'll see three or four you know, individuals that come in to see us. I do an assessment and realize that it's really about three or four of these components that are helping, you know, or are not helping the business and we, they need help. It is important to lower your risk. It's important to, you know, get experience, to plan ahead, as I said, with a business plan, get some support. Remember, SBDCs, even though, you know, they're, they're all over the place, they're, they're one, you know, in your backyard, I'm sure. So keep utilizing these resources and, you know, just keep preparing. Look at leveraging your strengths. Everyone has strengths. What are those strengths and how are you going to leverage this? Look for assistance. There's a lot of opportunities out there for uh, being able to utilize the uh, resources that are out there. And there are some grants out there. So keep in mind that your city may have some grants that may not be a lot, but they're good seed money to get your business set up. So I'm going to show you um, what I'm going to send you. Um, the um, Oops, hold on. I'll send you the um, resources for assistance that I think... Um, 
everything that I provided in this um, seminar is going to be Where is it? Hold on. So Raul will be sending this to you. It's got all of those um, temp uh, the um, links that you will need, especially I think this one, the DOI, and all the my biz insurance protection things that I showed you, U.S. the census.gov, city of Westminster, um, tax guide, and all the IRS information, SBA, and of course, the most important, <laughs> North Metro. So just kind of keep in mind that those are the resources that I think will ultimately truly give you some support as you work through um, the businesses for that you're, that you're, you are starting. Okay. Questions? Yeah, we have a question. Uh, are there any scholarships for small businesses? I see social media ads all the time, but uh, wondering if they're scams. Yeah, some are scams. Um, I think you got to be careful because they're enticers to other, um, you know, uh, opportunities for businesses to uh, try to lure you into their product. Um, you know, as I said, I don't know if, if I call them scholarships, I call them grants. I think for business, um, cities will provide some seed money. Um, I know that Thornton has a couple, as I said, Westminster has some, Boulder has some. Um, there are, you know, just very limited grants. Um, the city of uh, Denver has a, um, the Rocky Mountain Finance um, corporation has a grant if you um, work their um, their program for I think it's six weeks and they give you a grant so you know there are some there are some stuff out there that if you you know work through a good business plan I mean almost everyone is going to require for you to have some sort of a, a business plan to show that you know it's not free money they want you to be successful with some sort of a outcome Other questions? All righty. No questions in the chat, but uh, lots of thanks, gratitude for you, Jesse, and all the awesome information. Well, that's what I'm here for. Remember, it's it's all about, you know, you getting support with a uh, small business development center. We're here to help. And we want to for you to be successful. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jesse. We will uh, connect with you over email and go from there. You guys take care. Sounds good. Thank you. Bye.